A little while ago, I did a video about Minor Threat, and so many people have wanted me to continue the story and talk about Fugazi, so I thought it was about time I got around to doing that. Here's the story of Fugazi. Don't forget to give this video a like if you end up enjoying it, and subscribe so you don't miss more of these stories from music history. In the Minor Threat video, I kind of went into a lot of detail on Ian Mackay's background and his upbringing and his parents, and I don't want to rehash the same subject here, so I'll leave a link to that video in the description if you want a little bit more in-depth background. But here are some of the major bullet points that I think you should know from that video before we get into the story of Fugazi. Ian Mackay was born and raised in Washington, D.C. to parents who were pretty intellectual and open-minded. They let him experiment and try out things. His father was a writer and a journalist who ended up working as a White House correspondent for a bit. Ian got into punk music when he saw the Cramps perform, and then pretty soon he was going to Bad Brains shows and really just digging into the punk culture that was springing up in Washington, D.C. He was particularly influenced by the hardcore bands that were coming out of the California scene, so he started his own band called Minor Threat. I know it was called Teen Idols first. I'm skipping over a lot of stuff, so before you leave me a comment of all the things I'm skipping over, just watch the Minor Threat video goes more in depth in that video. Minor Threat quickly became one of the most prominent punk bands in the DC area, particularly in the hardcore scene, probably second only to Bad Brains, and their influence and impact quickly spread far outside of the East Coast. I'd say now they are one of the top five most famous hardcore punk bands, maybe even top three, depending on who you ask. While in Minor Threat, Ian started this movement that is known as Straight Edge, and it's basically this dedication to sobriety. He saw how drinking and drugs impacted his friends and took a lot of their energy and motivation, so he decided he didn't want any part of that and was committed to remaining sober. Through his songs about being sober and Straight Edge, it became kind of this political movement and kids all across the country became almost militant in their adherence to the straight edge movement. Something that Ian still kind of has mixed feelings about, I think. He also started a record label with his Minor Threat co-founder Jeff Nelson, which originally just existed to release his band's music, but it grew and became basically the flagship indie label in the Washington, D.C. area. Through that record label, which was called Discord Records, Ian helped to cultivate that DIY attitude of punk music and really watered the ground of the DC underground scene. Discord, which was headquartered in this building called the Discord House, became its own kind of community and was famous for giving artists really incredible deals instead of trying to screw them over any chance they got, like the other major labels at the time. I say at the time, it's all the time. Major labels are always doing that, always will always have. Minor Threat eventually broke up because the band had different ideas of where they wanted to go. A lot of the members wanted to go in a more melodic direction, kind of taking inspiration from bands like U2, while Ian wanted to stay underground and stay punk. There's more to it than that, but that's, you know, we're spark noting it here. Also, towards the end of Minor Threat's life, Ian started to become disillusioned towards hardcore punk. He started to notice a lot of people coming into the scene who weren't interested in the ethos of hardcore punk. They weren't interested in the music. They really just were attracted to the violence that the media said was this whole punk scene. So they would come just to kind of like start fights and be violent. A lot of the people who spearheaded the hardcore movement were stepping back because they were also feeling this change and didn't like it. So at a certain point, Ian would look into the audience and not recognize anyone there, and he just started to fall out of love with the hardcore scene. Ian's next band after Minor Threat, which was a short-lived band called Embrace, really embraced, pun intended, some of the more aggressive elements of hardcore punk, but it also added in aspects of more emotional stuff, which was a little bit of a departure from the punk scene. That band became tied to a movement known as Revolution Summer, which was an attempt to revitalize the hardcore community in Washington, D.C. By the summer of 1985, interest in hardcore was waning quite a bit because, like Ian, a lot of the forefathers started to fall out of love with it and be disillusioned by it. So bands that were kind of in the Discord house orbit got together and decided to try something different, try to breathe new life into this hardcore community that they 
initially really loved and just try and add something else to it. So they wanted to keep a lot of that raw energy and aggression and DIY attitude of the hardcore punk community, but layering in elements of emotion, kind of like we just talked about with Ian's band Embrace. He was not the only one doing that. There were a lot of other bands in the DC area in that summer really trying to get this new sound off the ground. The actual name Revolution Summer is attributed to Amy Pickering, who was an employee of Discord Records. Apparently a lot of people around the Discord community in like 1984 were talking about how to revitalize the scene that they once loved. They thought that they could just let the skinheads and the violent people have the hardcore community while they took the roots of it and started something new and exciting. So at a meeting at Discord House, Amy said, quote, okay, this summer we're going to do it. Summer 85, Revolution Summer, end quote. And the movement was born. Ian's addition to Revolution Summer, that band Embrace, only played nine shows together, but that music showcased his changing style, a change that would become much more apparent in Fugazi. After that, Ian tried to get a new project going with Jeff Nelson, who was the co-founder of Minor Threat and Discord Records, but it never really got off the ground. I take a beer break. I think I also was drinking beer during the Minor Threat episode, just really embodying the spirit of Ian Mackay and all of his principles. So at that point, Ian was a little gun shy about starting a new band. He still wanted to play music and he wanted to keep pushing the ethos of the Revolution Summer forward, but he wanted to play with people who wanted to play with him and not people who wanted Minor Threat Part 2. And that's when he started jamming with Joe Lally. Joe was born in 1963 in Maryland. Joe was first interested in soul and funk music, but as a teenager, he discovered classic rock and got super into classical metal. He told It's Psychedelic Baby magazine, quote, but I didn't understand punk at the time at all because it was just photos of the dead boys and I never heard any of it, end quote. And then he saw Dead Kennedys play with the Teen Idols, which was Ian's first band, and he became obsessed with punk. He changed his clothes, cut his hair, and started going to every hardcore show that he possibly could. Since there weren't too many other punks in his hometown and those people really didn't understand the punk music, he decided it was time to leave and he moved to Washington, D.C. where he could find more of a community. Most musicians, particularly punk musicians and punk-adjacent musicians, have this one moment. They have this band that they either hear a recording of or watch live and they have the thought, I could do that. That's normally the spark that gets someone playing punk. For Joe, it was hearing a band from San Francisco called Pink Section on like a compilation album. He said, quote, something about the Pink Section made me think I could do it. They didn't seem to be studied musicians and yet their music was so cool, end quote. At the time, Joe had a pretty good career going. He had a job at NASA, but he fell in with the Discord crowd and they inspired him to quit his job and go out on tour as a roadie with the band Beef Eater in 1986. After that tour, Joe started to hang out with Ian quite a bit and they bonded over their shared interest in more obscure bands. Ian told Joe that he was really interested in starting a new project that he described as the Stooges mixed with reggae, which really appealed to Joe. But Ian still wasn't quite sure that he wanted to actually start a band. He said in the book, Our Band Could Be Your Life, quote, my interests were not necessarily to be in a band, but to be with people who wanted to play music with me, end quote. Ian heard Joe play with Beefeater a few times while he was a roadie with them, and Ian was really impressed, so he invited Joe to come jam with him. He also invited Colin Sears, who was a drummer with Dag Nasty. They had their first meeting on September 24th, 1986, and some people cite that as like the official birth of Fugazi, but I don't think any of them necessarily thought it was going to become something. I think it was just three people who got together to jam and talk about music. After a few months of playing together, Colin left, and he was replaced by Brendan Canty. Brendan was born in New Jersey in 1966, but he moved to D.C. when he was still a baby. His father was a piano player who had a reverential love of jazz music and taught him all about the most important jazz artist as a kid. Brendan told Capital Bop, quote, He had seen everybody in the world. Ella singing in Duke Ellington's band, Miles at the Plugged Nickel. He was like, oh yeah, I saw that, and I saw that, and saw that. He would teach me about things, break out records, and as he was wiping them down with his hanky, tell me the story of when he saw them and where. End quote. He knew when he started drumming that he had a lot that he could learn from jazz musicians, but then he met Brian Baker, who was a member of the band Minor Threat when he was 14, and Brian introduced him to punk music. 
Eventually, he started playing in bands in the kind of Discord-adjacent community and ended up in a band called Insurrection. It was a pretty short-lived band that, by most accounts, was not very good, but three of the members, including Brendan, kept playing music together and started calling themselves Rites of Spring. Rites of Spring immediately got the backing of Ian, which any punk band in the DC area kind of needed in order to have any sort of success, and they became a force in the Revolution Summer Movement. Ian even produced their debut album in 1985. They broke up after 14 shows because they kept breaking their equipment and couldn't afford to keep playing. After Rites of Spring broke up, three of them, including Brendan, started a new band called One Last Wish. Brendan said, quote, In One Last Wish, they were great lyrics and cool songs, but the songs felt a little too formulaic at the time, a little constrained, end quote. One Last Wish pretty quickly fell apart, so they revived Rites of Spring, this time calling it Happy Go Licky, and their style to songwriting was very different this time. They played what Brendan called almost improvisational songs. They weren't improvised, but they were very loosely structured, kind of like a jazz song, actually. Even though it was made up of the same members, it was far more experimental than Rites of Spring, but the members never really talked about the issues that they had when they were Rites of Spring. They never worked through any of the problems that broke that band up. So everyone kind of knew that Happy Go Licky was not going to last very long. When Brendan first started playing with Ian and Joe, he had to kind of rein in some of his jazz flourishes that he was known for. Ian knew exactly what he wanted this new band to sound like, and it was not nearly as free-flowing as Brendan was used to in Happy Go Licky. After Brendan spent some time out west just kind of rethinking what he wanted to do with his life and figuring out what his future looked like, the band played their first show together in September of 1987. But they still didn't have a name, and they knew they needed to come up with something, or else, as Ian said in Our Band Could Be Your Life, quote, Otherwise, people would probably call it Ian's New Band, and I didn't think anybody wanted that, end quote. Ian found the word Fugazi in a book by Mark Baker called Nam, which was like a collection of Vietnam War stories. In that book, Fugazi was military slang for, like, a messed up situation, and Ian felt like that fit the band really well. Ian said, quote, It was ambiguous enough that it didn't have any particular taste or color or flavor. It wasn't immediately suggestive, like Jackhammer or Pussy Willow. It didn't have any overtly leading connotations to it. It was left to people's imagination, end quote. Much like the name, the band was also kind of open and ambiguous, which led to them including Brendan's best friend and longtime music collaborator, Guy Pachotto. Guy was born in 1965 in Washington, D.C., and had been a longtime member of the Discord community. He said that when he was younger, he was pretty mentally messed up and his music was born out of that. He also attended that same Cramps show in 1979 that inspired Ian, even though he didn't know Ian at that time. He told a Hee Haw fanzine in 1998, quote, It terrified me totally, but also made me realize the energy potential of what a band could do. After having only seen groups like Kiss and Aerosmith, who were great in a way, but totally removed, safe and vicarious, this was a primer in having something explode directly in front of your eyes. From then on, I was hooked in and hit shows all the time, seeing the clash soon after then the Bad Brains locally, and pretty soon the local scene with tons of preteens forming bands and taking over. Guy was always around the Discord community. He knew Ian back from his time in the Teen Idols, and he even attended quite a few minor threat practices. He also knew Brendan, because Brendan was making a name for himself in the hardcore punk community, and Guy particularly loved Brendan's first band called a Deadline. He first played with Brendan in Insurrection, and then went on to play in basically every band after that, including Rites of Spring, One Last Wish, and Happy Go Licky, so it never really felt right to keep him out of Fugazi. Even if no one really knew what he was going to do in the group, I mean, Ian was already the singer, so what was Guy going to do? Mostly, he started just singing background vocals, kind of like a hype man in a hip-hop group, and doing roadie work until Happy Go Licky officially broke up in 1988. And then Ian asked him to join Fugazi. He explained how him joining the group really changed how the band operated. He said, quote, Initially, the early stuff was predominantly put together by Ian and Joe as the stuff they had been working on prior to Brendan and I joining the band, and for the first few years, I didn't play guitar, but functioned almost like a toaster, doing backups, singing lead, and dancing around. But once I started playing guitar the way we write, changed dramatically. It became completely democratic, with every song bearing everyone's imprint. In January of 1988, still trying to put the pieces together of what the band was actually going to be, but really loving the journey, the band set out on their first tour. Since most of the members of the band were still getting to know each other, those hours spent in the van became a really big bonding experience, 
it did also lead to a few arguments between Ian and Guy, who were kind of the most opinionated, at least vocally opinionated, members of the group. From the start, Fugazi carried on with Ian's ideas from Minor Threat about subverting the commercialness of modern music. They never sold merch. Discord still doesn't really sell merch. Ian told a Swedish fanzine subdive, quote, To me, it's just like a bizarre parallel economy that comes on with music now. The fact that you even ask me that question in an interview, why don't you sell shirts? What kind of question is that to ask a band? It's like, would you go to a bakery and say, how come you don't sell shirts? He makes bread, you know, and I make music, end quote. I will say a lot of bakeries now also do sell shirts, though, so... <laughs> Maybe he was onto something, maybe not, who knows. They would also only play all ages shows and didn't want to make the tickets more than $5 a person. Sometimes they couldn't help it. I think sometimes they had to get up to like $7, but their target was always $5 a person. For Ian, it was about making the music and the show accessible to everyone. For Guy, it was kind of about the subversion of it all. He said in Our Band Could Be Your Life, quote, That's always been my attraction to it, the perversity of it, insisting on this thing. The idea that we could undercut it and make it work was comic, and it was also kind of a statement, end quote. They avoided all of the mainstream music trappings that they possibly could, refusing to give interviews to any magazine that they wouldn't read themselves. If they couldn't find a venue in a town that would meet their demands, they just wouldn't play there and would move on to the next city. They ended up playing a ton of basements and random places, just using this community of punks to build a subversion of a career. In their music, they worked hard to establish themselves as a band worthy of attention in their own right, not just as Ian Mackay's new project. They refused to play Minor Threat songs, which annoyed a few fans at the beginning, but those fans were quickly won over by just how good Fugazi was. Then in June of 1988, they recorded their debut EP called Fugazi at Inner Ear Studios, and even though it wasn't quite as good as their later stuff would be, it really showed the direction they were going and showed that there's something to this band. After that, they set out on a three-month European tour that was really draining for the group. At the end of that tour, they set up time to record their debut album in London, but they were so exhausted from the tour that they ended up not liking a lot of what they recorded, so they cut it down and released a second EP instead. It was called Margin Walker, and it was released in June of 1989. Eventually, those first two EPs were combined into one album called 13 Songs. It was at the end of that European tour that Guy started playing guitar in the band because he was kind of frustrated that he wasn't doing much, and that change dramatically impacted their sound. But they never bothered to classify or describe what that sound was, either for the fans or themselves. They just played what they wanted to play and let anyone draw any conclusions that they wanted to draw. Back in 1989, Guy explained to Melody Maker, quote, Fugazi functions pretty well in that we can tour and make records, but we find it pretty impossible to do anything beyond that. Once you start trying to say what a band represents, you put yourself into a little box and make it easier for people to have expectations of you. We don't want anybody to expect anything of us. In September of 1989, they entered Inner Ear Studios, where I have to imagine they felt more comfortable than in Southern Studios in London to record record their debut LP. Around that time, they changed the way they wrote songs. Instead of Ian basically writing all of the lyrics and running it by the other guys, it was more of a democratic process with all of them contributing something to the sound. Brendan said, quote, That's when we all threw ourselves into it really earnestly. It was the first time that both Guy and I could say, this is our band, end quote. The resulting album, Repeater, became a classic. I think it's arguably the best album to come out of the hardcore punk scene. I know it's not hardcore, but it came out of that scene. It was released in April of 1990, and Repeater initially didn't make any waves commercially, but between March of 1990 and June of 1991, the band played something like 250 shows in support of it. By this point, their shows were pretty large, frequently selling out 1,000 plus seat venues. Eventually, the album sales climbed, and it became a hit, especially for an underground indie band. But even with that newfound success, the band still did every everything themselves. They booked their own shows, carried their own equipment, found floors to sleep on in between gigs. This was a time where a lot of the major punk bands were signing major label deals, but Fugazi always felt that Discord did a fine job distributing their record, so why would they need to sign to a major label? They remained independent. They even turned down interviews with major music publications like Rolling Stone and Spin. Ian told Noiseworks, quote, As we've gotten bigger, there's choices we've had to make, and we don't like things out of our control. We're trying to maintain that right. Guy added specifically about Rolling Stone, quote, I can't see what in God's name they have to do with rock and roll. 
end quote. For their second album, they tried once again to use Ted nicely. He had done Repeater as well as their first EP, but he had become a pastry chef at a French restaurant and couldn't really find the time to fit in being a record producer. So, like they did with everything, they produced it themselves, and that might not have been the best decision. Ian said it just made sense for him to try and produce it since he had produced quite a lot of Discord Records albums, like Rites of Spring. He told the Battleground magazine, quote, when we went in to do the Fugazi record, I just sort of sat down in the producer's chair because that's what I've always done. But suddenly it was like there was a conflict of interest, right? Because I'm also in the band, end quote. Guy said, quote, it was a tough record for us to make. It was our first attempt at producing and mixing by ourselves, and we didn't feel like we had a really good handle technically on what we wanted to do. We were also pretty fried from back-to-back -back touring. I appreciate Steady Diet for a lot of things, but there was a flatness to both the performances and the sound that was weird to us. That album, Steady Diet of Nothing, was released in July of 1991, and it was like a pretty big hit even before it was released. Six months before it came out, Discord had more than like 160,000 pre-orders just because of how well Repeater did and how excited people were to hear something new by Fugazi. Their third album, In on the Kill Taker, originally recorded in Chicago with Steve Albini but re-recorded with Ted Nicely at Inner Ear Studios, became their first album to chart. It came out in June of 1993, kind of in the height of that alternative music craze, so it rode the wave both of Fugazi's years of success and the popular sound of the time. It was just this perfect mixture. So I guess it's technically the band's breakthrough album, but I don't know too many Fugazi fans who think it's better than Repeater. They continued to sell out theaters and were offered $10 million to sign with Atlantic Records. Fugazi refused. As Ian told Perfect Sound Forever, quote, no amount of money is worth losing control of our music. End quote. They also refused to play festivals, famously turning down Lollapalooza. Ian said, quote, We have a particular idea of how we want things to be done. In festivals, we can't ask everybody in a festival to do it our way. So instead of, like, being a part of something like that, we just do our own shows. And people who want to see Fugazi can come see Fugazi. End quote. Which, honestly, that's my perspective on festivals as well. I've not, I've been to a couple. I never like them. I don't feel like you really get a full experience of what the band is when you go see them at a festival. I much prefer just seeing the band at their own show. For their next album, Red Medicine, released in 1995, the band wanted to change direction a bit. They didn't work with Ted, and they went with a more ambient sound than the aggression of In on the Kill Taker. Critics, again, loved it, and the band went on a massive tour in support of it. Understandably, they were exhausted from years of back-to-back -back touring and recording albums, so they took a little bit of time off while they worked on writing for the next album. They wanted to be more relaxed, and they wanted to take more time with their next work. It took about seven months, but they finally released End Hits in 1997. It leaned further into that experimental direction, so people were a little confused by it at the time, but it's largely loved now. But this kind of new musical direction they were taking changed their focus away from live music, which is where it had always been. A lot of the earlier material had been written to be sung along to at shows. Ian had this idea of the record being the menu and the show being the meal. To him, it was all about the live show. It was all about people in a room together, having fun, sweating, singing to music, and just having a great experience in that moment. But as they started to get more experimental, that had to change. Ian told the Battleground magazine, quote, with end hits too, some of those songs, the way we did them in the studio, we couldn't replicate live, end quote. But they took those same ideas into their next album, The Argument, released in 1999, and they took a more relaxed approach to writing and recording it. They released it at the same time that they released The Furniture, which was an EP that they recorded at the same time as the album. In an interview with Benjamin Howarth, Guy explained the recording process of this album and how it was a bit different. He said, quote, We went in not knowing if we were going to come out with a record. We just booked time in the studio and we knew we had some songs, but not everything we had was finished. So we didn't know if it was going to lead to a record. It went so smoothly that we ended up with enough material for an album and an EP, so it went better than expected. By this point in their career, the band was taking a lot longer in between doing stuff than fans were used to. As the argument was coming out, Ian did an interview with Fracture Magazine and said, quote, Quote, Joe and his wife are having a baby. As a policy of the band, when someone has a kid, the band goes into an indefinite hiatus until the parents of the kid are ready for the dad to go away, end quote. I mean, honestly, I love that policy. I think more kids of band members could benefit from having that be a larger policy across a lot of other bands. On November 4th, 2002, they completed three sold-out nights at the London Forum, and then they went on an indefinite hiatus assuring people that they never broke up because they wanted to spend more time with their families and working on other projects. 
So naturally, during the hiatus, the band members all kind of splintered and focused on different things that they were excited about. I talked about Ian's other projects in the Minor Threat video, so I'm not going to really cover that too much here. I don't think I covered it too much in the Minor Threat video either now that I'm thinking about it, but maybe that'll be for the future video. I don't know. But he formed a band called The Evens, and he's kept working on Discord records, and he's produced a few albums. Joe has worked with a band that was originally called Decahedron, and he's released a couple albums with a band called Ataxia. In the fall of 2006, he released a solo album called There to Hear, and his second solo album in 2007 called Nothing is Underrated. He's toured with several different bands and reunited with Ian to form a band called Koriki. He also joined a band with Brendan called Mesthetics. Mesthetics? I, I don't know. I'm I can't, I don't know, Mesthetics, which is an instrumental band that is more jazz focused. Brendan has done a lot of work with film scoring and soundtracks as well as working as a producer. He still lives in Washington DC with his four kids. Guy has collaborated with a variety of different projects and bands and he's worked as a producer on a ton of different things. Understandably, the four of them are constantly asked about potential reunions. Joe told Louder that you can never say never, but added, quote, there does seem to be a lack of time to allow it to happen because the four of us would have to spend a lot of time together to figure it out. Should we play old songs? Who are we now? What is it now? We are not the kind of band to get together and just rehearse two hours of old songs to go out and play it, rake in the dough, and come home. Brendan added, quote, if we got back together, it would have to be from the spirit of creativity. You can't put an inherently creative group back together and then not have that creative element. It would be different if we got back together, end quote. But Joe did tell the Creative Control podcast that the group still gets together and hangs out when they're all in DC. He said, quote, we have a great time together. Go out to dinner and we'll play some music together, end quote. But he stressed that that does not mean that there's a reunion coming. They just enjoy hanging out with each other. He said that they just don't have the time to commit to Fugazi and give it the attention that it deserves. Ian has repeated what the other guys have said, insisting that even though the band's not broken up and they still enjoy hanging out with each other, there just isn't time in the schedule to work on Fugazi right now. He told Loud and Quiet, quote, I mean, Fugazi never broke up. We may or may not play again. We don't know. We get an awful lot of requests for Fugazi, but it doesn't matter because we will play if and when we choose to. If we decide to get together again, we will do so. And if we decide to do that publicly, we will do that. And if we decide not to, we won't. We're very clear about that. End quote. So that's the story of Fugazi, at least up until this point. Maybe we'll see more from them in the future. Maybe not. But I think what they were able to do while they were a band before this hiatus cemented them as probably one of the best bands to ever come out of the American music scene. Let me know what you think about Fugazi. Let me know what you think about this video. Anything that I kind of overlooked or missed, leave a comment below. Like the video if you ended up liking it. And don't forget to subscribe to hear more stories from music history.